Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am just another tinfoil hat. Welcome back to my show. Today, we are going to finish with part two of our two-part Halloween spooktacular on the infamous Stanley Hotel. Of course, inspiration for the Overlook Hotel in Stephen King's The Shining. And a quick update on the weather. It is snowing even harder. Um, yeah. Now, part one of the two-part series um, dealt exclusively with the history and haunted lore of this fantastic location. This one is going to be the dissection video, where we look at the phenomenon and see what patterns might exist between it and other types of paranormal phenomena. Now, kind of on that vein, I usually take a very Keelian view of things. If you've seen any of my other videos, um, I tend to believe that all paranormal occurrences seem to be connected. Um, that it's almost like there's a nucleus to this phenomenon that puts on different masks for different shows. Now, if you've seen, again, other of my videos, you'll also probably have heard me say that I also believe there are exceptions to this concept. Um, a great example of that is the Bigfoot phenomenon. I do believe that, you know, most sightings of Bigfoot fall under this kind of broad umbrella of just anomaly, um, resulting in such encounters where Bigfoot kind of fades away as though he's some sort of phantasm or disappears into sparks of light. However, I think that there's enough evidence to suggest that there are probably flesh and blood hominids in North America that people sometimes see, you know, just an undiscovered creature um, in the vein of classic cryptozoology. Um, again, I don't think that's really most of the sightings, but I think that there is kind of a strong vein of sightings of that nature. Now, in the same sort of vein, I do have a rather classic view of a lot of different types of ghostly phenomenon. Um, you know, this is a personal take and it is influenced from personal experiences which I've had with, you know, again, quote unquote, haunted locations. Now, when I say I take a classic view of, you know, some cases of hauntings, um, to me, it's just that I, I do seem to think that a lot of these experiences have to do with entities which seem to somehow be related to the energies of individuals who have passed. Now, as to how this is, I have no idea. Um, I don't think it's quite as neat and tidy as, you know, oh, the spirit is just kind of wandering the halls or whatever. To me, it seems as though these locations, which have hauntings, um, there's something there with, in my opinion, the fabric of time and reality itself. These are places where either of its own accord, it runs differently, or perhaps we simply interact with it differently. And I think that's, you know, really my favorite part of paranormal research, and definitely kind of what drives me, is that it calls a lot of these very deep issues into question. How do we interact and perceive reality or time? How does it interact with us? You know, what, if anything, perceives us back? And so that's, you know, kind of my view on ghosts, I guess. So it's not exactly as concrete as like Scooby-Doo, you know, or American Horror Story or something. And it is definitely still kind of on that very nebulous, very muddy road of a sort of Keelian standpoint on things. Um, but I do think, again, I just have that sort of classic, um, I guess, feeling that, you know, these are related to, you know, for lack of a better term, the spirits of the dearly departed. Now, the amazing thing about so many of these locations, however, and especially in looking just at the Stanley, is that it kind of has a trifecta of different types of ghostly occurrences. You know, you have the classic interactive ghostly phenomenon. Um, you have residual occurrences. Um, of course, that's a kind of key word for your classic spectrology, these residual haunts. And then you also have this very nebulous, um, less personal phenomenon. So I'm kind of going to go through a bunch of the accounts that I mentioned and kind of sift them out into these three different aspects. As far as interactive haunts go, um, probably the most classic example of this, and this is something that you'll get from haunted locations all over the place, is of people interacting with what they believe is another person who then proceeds to fade away right in front of them. Um, I just, I absolutely love that concept of, you know, you walk up to talk to somebody, maybe they're wearing weird clothes, but you know, you're in a historic location, so it's not that off. And then all of a sudden they start fading into oblivion or they just vanish completely. Um, on the flip side to that, you also have, again, these kind of very oblivious ghosts, I guess you could say. Um, and I think this falls really neatly into the concept of a residual haunt where people will see you know, figures just going about their business, whether it's 
the ghost of a chambermaid which appears to be straightening objects or you know the image of someone walking down the stairs and they're completely oblivious that anything is going on around them um a lot of people believe that this is just some sort of trapped energy it's almost like a recording that plays over and over again the weirdest thing to me is that you know a lot of the times when we're talking about these residual haunts, another great example is the chambermaid that's said to walk through a wall that has been put up recently. I mean, you see that all the time in haunted locations where people will talk about how a ghost is walking a few inches above the floor because the floor was a different level back in the day. The weird thing here is that, again, one of the prime examples of these so-called residual haunts is the chambermaid, um, Mrs. Leitenberg or Mrs. Wilson, whoever was lighting the lamps in room 217. And... It's weird because people claim that she just goes about her business straightening objects and, you know, doing chambermaid work, but then the objects themselves are moved. So again, as soon as you try and put something into a category, it's like there's still something to kind of refute that. And that is something to me that is very exciting about the paranormal, is that as soon as you're ready to put up a little neat and tidy box to put something in, like, okay, the chambermaid did her job the same way for God knows how many years, and then she died and she's still doing it in death. Um, as soon as you're ready to say, okay, that's a residual haunt and we're going to go on our way, there's always that one piece that doesn't quite fit. Um, you know, as to, again, why, if she, it's just the image of something going about its business, how does an image interact with objects? For that matter, how does something incorporeal react with objects? Um, and I think that this is just an example of how it seems as though true anomalies are always unattainable. They're always just out of our reach. And you know, a great example of that in this case, too, is the fact that so many people will claim to hear the sounds of a party going on. And as soon as they get close to where the music is coming from, they open the door to the ballroom. It stops. Um, there have even been accounts where people do exactly that and they close the door and they go back to what they're doing. And as soon as they go back to what they're doing, the party starts up again. So, you know, that kind of unattainability of anomaly is something that I just... It's confounding and honestly quite frustrating, but also very exciting. Now, on the topic of phantom parties, you know, this is a great example of, is this, again, you kind of your classic haunt, or is this something that belongs to the much broader scope of just whatever true anomaly is? Because, of course, when people look at this from the strict spectrology um, standpoint, They'll say, oh, well, you know, it's just the echoes of the many parties that were held here in years past. Um, you know, or maybe an entity is very nostalgic for that and is somehow producing this noise, producing this effect on the witness. On the flip side, if you go to the British Isles, um, the good folk were said to do the exactly the same thing. Witnesses would be out late at night and all of a sudden they would hear this phantom music. They would look sometimes and see spectral dancers as though there was some sort of you know, ghostly party going on. And at least for the people that got away, it was said that they would try and approach the music, they'd approach the party and the dancers, and as they did so, it would simply fade away. Another aspect of this um, phenomenon that is prevalent across every single different uh, kind of discipline of paranormal research is the prevalence of light anomalies. And of course, here too, in this classically haunted location, we have these orbs of light that people report seeing um, and again, not just, you know, reflections, or not just occurring on rolls of film where it's unfortunately usually dust motes, but instead actually moving around objects, interacting with objects in the three-dimensional world. So light phenomena, again, is prevalent across every different type of paranormal occurrence. To me, I think that it is something that's very close to the heart of whatever anomalies truly are. Another thing that is very much associated with every different type of paranormal occurrence is the Oz factor, which of course was coined by Jenny Randalls. Um, this concept of people feeling as though they've entered this almost like bubble of reality where everything goes silent, everything goes still. And it's almost like the only thing that exists is them and whatever anomaly they may be witnessing. And so here, you know, it's interesting because we have, again, this classically haunted location where people are reporting it's almost as though they slip into another reality where everyone has vanished. The fact, too, that so many ghosts appear in these liminal areas, these places which are symbolic of being thresholds, whether it's in doorways, through windows, or on stairways, or in hallways. Um, again, you know, is this evidence that this is part of something much bigger, or is it simply evidence that, you know, whatever ghosts are, they also belong to this other world? 
which is only able to interact with us at these threshold points. Two, we always have the concept of would this place be as active if it wasn't as famous? Um, of course, there is the strictly psychological concept that if someone is staying in a haunted location, the house settling is immediately transformed into ghosts walking the halls. However, I'm not referring specifically to that, even though I will admit that that is definitely something to keep in mind when you're looking at ghostly phenomena. However, I'm talking about, you know, is this added attention that is given to the ghostly occurrences at this place, um, does it somehow feed into the phenomena? Does it somehow fuel perhaps expectations? A great example of that for me is that in room 401, you have effectively some very classic poltergeist phenomena. Um, of course, referring then to some sort of occurrence which doesn't really have a human personality, um, or at least, you know, a, a former human personality, um, but is just simply this chaotic um, force that moves objects, that causes things to disappear, that slams doors. And so you have this very, like, for all intents and purposes, strict poltergeist room. And then people start to claim that they see Lord Dunraven, that he blows cigarette smoke in their face. And the interesting thing about that is that Dunraven was never actually in the hotel at all. So, you know, again, is the expectation of who should be there or what should be there, does that somehow fuel how this stuff occurs, how it appears to people? Um, it is also interesting, though, because often people will recognize him after they see the portrait, which is after they had the occurrence. Now, again, I'm sure, you know, did they perhaps pass it and it lodged itself in their subconscious? Who knows? Um, pretty much, I have no answers. I just have a bunch of questions. Now, to end yet again on my favorite account that I found from the Stanley, um, is the very urban legendy account of the man who claimed that his deceased wife woke him up in the middle of the night. Um, again, you know, it seems to me as though this is evidence that these places which we consider to be haunted, it's not as though the haunting belongs to the entities which at one point resided there. It's almost as though these areas are just places where reality and time, um, where they don't work as cleanly and as neatly as we mortals would like them to. And so, you know, in these locations, these liminal zones, or as John Keel would term them, window areas, it seems as though whatever denizens of the other world there may be, whether it's, you know, true anomalies, whether it's the good folk, whether it's the spirits of the dearly departed that once resided there, or even, you know, the spirits of those that people in this location once knew, it seems as though they're allowed to kind of pass through into this reality. Um, and again, you know, this is my Halloween special for this year. I know Halloween was yesterday by the time you guys are watching this. But even that concept of Halloween being a time when the veil between worlds is thinner than usual. You know, I think that there is a lot of sense, if we can say there's sense in anything in the paranormal, to that concept. Well, if you enjoyed this spooky special edition on the Stanley Hotel, please like, and if you're new to this field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe to see what weirdness the future may have in store. Till then, you can keep up with me on my free blog at patreon.com slash justanothertinfoilhat. For today, I am Zelia Edgar, signing off. Great party, isn't it?